sure to come down with us in the snowstorm. <laughs> When did you say you were heading to our neck of the woods? Uh, be headed to uh, Crane Creek tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. And then uh, leave from there and spend the night in the uh, RV up at Bennett. Fish the current. Uh, actually, fish Bennett Springs Friday. Fish the current Saturday. Head back home and either stop off at Tanny Como or at Roaring River Sunday. I'm going to work all week. <laughs> I'll catch a fish for you and send you a picture. Awesome. Thanks. <laughs> Keep in mind, you got to get in a boat with me on the river in about three months, and I will throw you out. I know. I know, man. So, um, I got a couple of new rafts late last year, uh, back in September, and uh, I ordered a new set of Sawyer oars for, for the third raft. Uh, I had I had two good sets for two of the rafts, and then I had this flimsy set uh, for the two-person raft. So anyway, got a, got a new set of really nice oars on the way. Be here tomorrow. Um, so we'll be I'll, I'll be I'll, I'll have her rigged up and ready to roll before you guys get here for sure. All three of them, and we're gonna have a good time. Five online, Greg. Yeah, where the little eyeball is. Yes, but they have to be a member of the group, right? So, so keep. Oh, okay. I don't know what dead settings are on the group. I know I've had 500 notifications in the last week that people want to add. Ever since we announced this. <laughs> and then when we did the online dues, we had like five people pay dues that we had never heard of. So we've decided we're never having a banquet again, and we're just going to spam emails for the rest of the time. <laughs> it should be planned. Something on his end. I don't know, he's got a phone. It says there's 11 people watching it, so.
All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, for those of you joining us online tonight, we have with us Donovan Clary, who is a guide on the Illinois River, uh, both the upper and the lower in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. Is that about the closest Correct. that people know? Correct. Yeah, the, um, northern, the, the northern uh, or the upper river is near Tahlequah, and the southern, uh, the, the, the lower river is near Gore. And he fishes for a multitude of species, which we'll get into with the presentation tonight. But uh, we'll just go ahead and let him get started as people are rolling in. So uh, thank you for being with us, Donovan, and go ahead and begin when you're ready. Hey, thanks for having me. So uh, guys, uh, especially you guys uh, joining online, I don't have any record or any way to see who is here uh, or to see any kind of questions or anything. So please take the, uh, the phone number down. Uh, you can find me on Facebook. If you have questions, uh, don't be afraid to call or text or, uh, shoot me an email, send me a message, whatever you need to do. Be happy to help you out. Uh, so second of all, thank you guys for tuning in and spending your time. Listen to me ramble about, uh, one of my biggest obsessions and Hopefully, it'll be something that you can find useful in the future. And uh, again, if you have questions or you need help, uh, don't don't hesitate to get in touch with me, and I'll help you out the best I can. And uh, if you decide you want to come and go on a trip, we'll, we can do that too. So um, jumping right ahead, uh, I've been uh, fishing the Illinois River uh, literally for almost 47 years now. Uh, my grandparents uh, were both born uh, in small communities that are now underneath Ten Killer Lake, which is what was formed when they dammed up the Illinois River. Um, a lot of people don't know, but Ten Killer gets its name from uh, when they did dam build the dam on the lake. Uh, it was in the early 1950s. It killed ten small communities, displaced people from ten small communities. And my grandparents on my mother's side. Um, were, were part of those those families of those communities so my grandfather tells me times of fishing in the river before the lake was even there uh when he was a boy running up and down the river and uh, my grandmother uh, you know has some memories too that i've gotten uh from her as well so i've got a lot of history there on the river uh both the upper section after smallmouth and the lower section chasing trout and striper and a number of other species that are coming up out of the Arkansas River. So um, moving right along, uh, let's go to the next slide, if you would. Uh, this picture coming up on the next slide, I don't know if it'll let me, yeah, it won't let me, it won't let me uh, control it. So um, so this, this picture is a, a smallmouth uh, that I caught there on the upper section. Uh, we do have some smallmouth below the lake in the lower section um, of the river, but primarily your your um, higher concentration of smallmouth are going to be on the upper sections of the river. So uh, this is a big Neosho strain, uh, which it's not recognized as a uh, substrain of the smallmouth bass, but it is definitely different. And um, you know, I've I've lobbied for it. I've sent pictures discussion, uh, fin samples, uh, trying to get it recognized as another uh, subspecies of smallmouth bass. Uh, however, uh, it hasn't been yet. But if you guys fish anywhere in the Ozarks, uh, most likely you're familiar with the Neosho strain of smallmouth bass, and they're uh, predominant on the upper Illinois River. Um, and that's just a list of a few things that I've been able to accomplish through fly fishing here recently, and uh, I've been uh, my number one love is smallmouth, but a close second is going to be a toss-up between trout and carp. So if you haven't tried fly fishing for carp, um, you definitely need to check it out. It's uh, it's a big, big in Europe, and it's slowly gaining some traction here. And uh, sure, it sure is fun. It's one of the, one of my my favorite things to do. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, so this is a big uh, a striper. Uh, so this this fish was caught Memorial Day 2019 uh, in the big pool right below the powerhouse. So we're kind of jumping around here, back and forth between the the uh, upper and the lower sections. 
but this uh, this slide is here just to show you the types of fish or the species of fish that you're going to encounter uh, in the Illinois River. Uh, now, really about the only thing that uh, is different here is all of the trout are below the lake and all of the striper are below the lake. So we do have some hybrid bass uh, that were stocked in Ten Killer Lake and you'll encounter those on the upper sections as they migrate up out of the lake, you know, moving upstream to spawn. Um, and I'd have to look at our mileage map, uh, but I did have an encounter of uh, a nine to 10 pound hybrid uh, stripping streamers for smallmouth uh, near one of the pub or one of the private access points that we used uh, to take out a lot uh, several several times this year and uh, it's a big deep hole uh, some slower water and uh, you know did encounter a big big uh, hybrid bass up there but if you go down the list the, the striper below the lake uh, both of the smallmouth um, you know are above and below the lake uh, the trout's below the lake, and then of course carp, buffalo, gar, hybrid uh, bass, and white bass are all above the lake uh, in the upper sections of the river. Um, so this this slide is specifically getting back to the Upper Illinois. We'll start here and work our way down. So uh, I, I, I was brushing up on some research uh, an hour ago, and um, I've always thought it to be 64 to 65 miles of river where the Illinois River starts in Oklahoma at the Arkansas state line um, and, and actually found another uh, uh, study that uh, said that it was closer to 70 miles. Regardless, we've got well over 60 miles of river from the Arkansas state line all the way through Oklahoma down to where uh, it dumps into the Arkansas River. Um, our water flow averages is 800 CFS. Uh, which is plenty to float kayaks or rafts, drift boats, um, ran a clacker craft drift boat, ran a McKenzie drift boat, uh, and now I've got uh, got three rafts now that we run, and we don't have any problems as far as you know uh, enough water to float the rafts. Late summer, sometimes this year it wasn't a problem. Last year we had a couple of shoals that we would have to get out and drag over, but it, it, it's. 10 or 20 feet you know it's not a not a great big drag and it's something that i can do all by myself so you know if we're in the boat we're floating down some of the kayak guys that i went through uh, a couple of them could get into a narrow chute and they didn't even have to get out but uh, most of the time the water at, C at 800 cfs is plenty uh, to float any of the upper sections um, you know of, of of the river from uh, and we'll get to this on the map but from chewy bridge down uh, there is one access point further upstream, about eight miles, called Fiddler's Bend. And I'll be honest with you, that's as far upriver as I have explored. Um, I've been further upriver, you know, as a kid with my grandfather and, you know, floating down it in a kayak or a, a canoe back in those days. Uh, but um, I don't spend any time there now just because... Um, you know, the shuttling is an issue. The public access points are further apart than what you can uh, realistically fish and fish effectively uh, in six or eight, ten hours. Uh, so anyway, 800 CFS, um, of course, in the wet months, early spring, it's deeper, higher water. Um, and then dry months or, uh, you know, dry years, it's a little less. But average 800 CFS, which is plenty. Uh, so smallmouth is what you're going to encounter the most of. Uh, if you're into hunting species, smallmouth buffalo are going to, um, they're going to be everywhere. You're going to see them, especially in the months of March and early April when they're starting their spawn. There will literally be thousands of smallmouth buffalo, and they can be caught on a fly rod. Um, I would tell you, don't show up with a four weight if you're trying to catch buffalo. Uh, most of the time, we're after those things with six and eight weights. And, uh, they are super, super strong. Um, carp you're going to encounter is going to be commons. Not quite as many common carp as, definitely not as many carp, common carp as there are buffalo. Uh, gar, both short nose, uh, long nose, spotted gar. Uh, you're going to find those, excuse me, especially in the lower sections, uh, down closer to the lake. And, um, you know, I take trips every year handful of guys will come out and we're throwing rope flies 
and we're stripping them in. And if you've ever tangled up with a gar on a fly rod, it is um, it's a lot of fun. And they jump, they fight. Um, they're easy to trick if you can find them. And once they bite into that rope, there's no hooks. It's just frayed out three eighths inch nylon rope, uh, about eight inches long. And you got to come up with a bite leader, like 30 to 40 pound mono, just because their teeth are pretty sharp, you know, and anything smaller than about 20 or 25 pound, uh, you know, one nick and it breaks. So if you run something heavier, um, they start spinning and rolling after you tangle up with them, uh, less likely to lose them when they, you know, when they do bite your string or, or, you know, nick it with their teeth. So uh, the upper sections of the river, there is so many uh you know, scenic areas, big, tall, um, you know, rock outcroppings, cliffs, bluffs, uh, crystal clear water. Visibility is usually six to eight feet. You can look down and see rocks, see crawdads, um, you know, clear water and uh, a lot of a lot of real scenic areas, um, you know, along the river. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So the best months... Uh, they're definitely going to be the warmer months. Um, however, the big fish months are usually, you know, late March, early April, depending on, you know, uh, rain and water levels. Uh, of course, you're catching those spawning fish. Uh, last year, uh, one of the best days that we had was in very in early April. I think it was the first Saturday in April. And we two, put two fish in the five to six pound range in the boat. One of them was a tagged uh, Kentucky bass. And you can see pictures of it on my Facebook page. I was pretty proud of it. A friend of mine uh, from Oklahoma City caught it. And uh, uh, it was tagged a year prior and uh, somewhere between five, five and a half pounds. And then uh, uh, the other friend of mine that was in the raft uh, ended up with a big northern uh, strange smallmouth, again, uh, that would rival that uh, uh rival that spotted bass so uh, look you're going to want to look for you know places to fish it, it, fly fishing for them uh the neo shows you know both both of the smallmouth are going to going to stay in the deeper water most of the time uh, and the, the neo shows are going to move up into the riffles to feed their feeding habits are a little bit different uh, the, the lake fish or the northern strain smallmouth they're a little bit bigger a little fatter and they're lazier. They're going to, uh, you know, they fight like crazy, but they're still lazier. They're going to uh, wait kind of in ambush. They're not really going to chase quite like the Neo shows like to up in the shallows. Um, you know, those knee deep riffles kind of like trout. Um, and where you're going to look for them is, you know, around any kind of current obstruction, just like if you're trout fishing, you know, that's where they're going to lay in wait. And uh, one of the key techniques or one of the key um you know, things that I tell people, especially when we're stripping flies for these fish, is most of the time that they don't want to eat stuff that is swimming upstream. So, you know, you're going to want to be making quarter shots, you know, quarter and upstream, you know, perpendicular, quarter and downstream. Uh, but you don't want to be downstream in, in heavy flow where you're going to have a swing. Uh, now, that being said, uh, there are times when those those neoshas will move into the shallows, into the riffles, the moving water, knee deep, and they're going to be in there chasing small bait fish. And you can swing, you know, uh, small streamers, you know, big woolly boogers or uh, lunch money is one of my favorite flies. And uh, anything, you know, minnow or shad color, a lot of grays, a lot of whites, uh, grays over whites, sometimes with red when the when the minnows get into their spawning colors. Um, you can swing them through those riffles, and at the tail out of those riffles, um, you know, you'll catch a bunch of fish. So, you know, most of the time, those big fish that we're catching, you know, we're catching them on big, heavy uh, sink tip lines, big streamers, but very few of them are coming on a retrieve that is not downstream or perpendicular. Um, so look for those ambush spots, the laydowns. Uh, bridge pylons is one of the – there's only a couple of bridge areas or bridges that we are – uh, fishing on the river three to be specific um, and around those pylons especially early season I feel like the cement uh, you know warms up a little faster the bait fish may be coming to the cement to the rocks to stay warmer um, and that's that's the boulders or the riprap that they've got around most of the bridges um, you know that's a that's a real good place to check out 
especially early season and late season. And like I said, I think it's because of the, the thermal effect that the rocks, the cement's getting warmer, the bait fish are hanging out there, and then the fish are coming in to feed on the bait fish. So um, another thing that I've learned that you guys need to keep uh, in mind if you get up here and you're starting to check this place out is don't fish it too fast. You know, get out, beach up, especially if you're in a kayak or something and you see a spot that looks good, um, you know, drag the thing up on the bank and get out and do some wet wading most of the river is going to average six to eight feet deep in the deepest holes there's a few holes that are deeper than that but most of the wet wading uh, that we're doing is way steeper shallower and uh, you know, i would say on average is probably somewhere between knee and pocket deep and uh, you know getting up close to a lot of the gravel bars or the ledges that the fish are holding downstream on and, uh, you know, really picking it apart and slowing down. Um, most of my float trips, there's a few of the other guides uh, that run up here. There's four of us that are, uh, that are serious. Um, I'm the only one that's full-time. Uh, but, um, you know, we'll, we'll work together. And, you know, the, the, the guys that are serious about it, we're, we're only going to float six to eight miles at most. And, you know, a six-mile float is going to take eight hours fishing with me. Um, and that same six-mile float, uh, there's been a couple of trips early last year that we spent 10 or 12 hours on the, on the river and only floated six miles. So, you know, we're, we're really picking apart a lot of the cover and uh, getting out and wading and fishing uh, slow and methodical. Um, and any time, you know, during the week, definitely lower tra slower traffic. Uh, a lot less people on the river uh, and then down finally the last bullet point is avoid three-day weekends now that three-day weekends if you plan to come and you have you know if that's your only option um, I, I wouldn't deter you from coming just know which sections have the fewer outfitters running on those sections because you know there's two two of the better sections up top that you're going to be I mean, you're going to be covered up with rafts and kayaks, and canoes of, of people out there. They're partying, swimming, drinking beer, you know, having a good time. And, you know, you're going to be trying to fish. And it can be done, but it's not for everybody, and you better be patient, you know. Uh, so uh, there are some sections further down. One in particular, um, and it's going to be a long float. If you're doing it in a kayak, you'll be fine. If you're doing it in a raft, you're going to spend the night. But, uh, you know, the, the, you won't have any traffic from any of the outfitters uh the only people you're going to see is people in their personal watercraft and most of those people are going to be there to fish so you won't won't be competing with with those people so if you're coming on a three-day weekend call me i'll tell you which sections to consider and uh, if i've been in one of them you know recently i'll tell you which one has been fishing the best and where to go and what to do so just keep that in mind uh, next slide please so this is a, a map of um, kind of the middle part of the river uh, so uh, up at Riverside Resort uh, about goodness I'm going to say somewhere around three miles three to four miles uh, from Round Hollow up uh, so if you can see the white um, uh, bullet there at the top uh, Round Hollow public access so Round Hollow up to Chewy Bridge is roughly four miles um, so four miles up further up river probably you know just off of the screen is where Chewy Bridge is going to be um, that section is very very good there's a lot of timber um, easy accesses both both launch and takeout the drawback to that float is the shuttle is a little bit long uh, just by the way that the highway wraps around it's going to take you 15 or 20 minutes uh, to port or to drive between the two access points and you know on on that float you're going to encounter a few floaters just because uh, of Riverside Resort and you know they're they're running you know some of their shuttles up and launching at a private launch uh, just below Chewy Bridge uh, but there's a lot of good floats through, or a lot of good fishing through there a lot of good areas and that's a pretty good float um, that that section is where those two big fish came from uh, early April last year and uh, 
once you once you come down from Chewy Bridge, if you're fishing that section, about a mile down the river is going to make a, a, a bend to the left, and there's going to be heavy timber, dead washes, dead falls, uh, some stumps uh, on the right side, river right, and that's where those big fish came from. And we caught several big fish through that that section, um, all the way up until. Goodness, uh, late September uh, was when the water finally got so low that we kind of stopped fishing up there. Um, I can remember taking a trip up there early September and catching a bunch of fish. Um, and, you know, a- after that, that section kind of dies down. And then if you'll move further down, uh, another one of the good uh, sections that I like to float is from Round Hollow down to, to Peavy. I think that's four miles. I've got my mo- notes here. So around all the P-Vines. Roughly five miles. Five miles on the river from Round Hollow down to P-Vine. That's one of the uh, busiest floats as far as rentals go. Just because you have Hanging Rock, Arrowhead, and Eagle Bluff. All three uh, of those uh, shuttles or, or those rental companies, float companies, launching at Round Hollow. And, and then floating down. So if you're going to float that on a weekend, get started early. And when I say started early, I'm talking like daylight or, you know, not long after. Uh, that way you'll be further ahead of the, all of the, you know, the partiers and, you know, you won't have to be uh, worrying about that. Um, the next section down would be Peavine to Edmondson. Uh, this section is hands down my number two favorite all time. Big fish, a lot of fish, um, easy accesses, uh, very, very short shuttle between cars uh, or between uh, parking lots. Um, if you're coming in from Tahlequah, which most of you guys up uh, around the Joplin area will probably be coming south on Highway 10, so you're going to have to backtrack. But if you're coming in from Tahlequah, the way we do it is up the river, you know, stop at Edmondson, shuttle dr- vehicle drop off, drive up to Peavine and we launch and six to eight hours later we're back at Edmondson and hopefully we've got 50 fish in the boat and 49 of them are five pounders but it doesn't always happen like that but we hope and and that section between Peavine and Edmondson um, that that's the biggest fish it, it for me um, th- that's the biggest fish uh, as far as numbers and uh, yeah there's been there, personally I have caught had people catch and put more big fish in the raft in that section than any of the other sections. There is another one down that's good. Uh, that's going to be a close second as far as big fish. Uh, the section, my number one float. But if you're going and you're wanting to catch big fish, I would tell you a Peavine to Edmondson and pay attention to the left bank um, all the way down. Uh, Edmondson down to No Head is a pretty good float um there's a lot of traffic there because you've got three of the biggest um and and one of the best um uh, so green river isn't there anymore but illinois river outfitters is is working that port um so that's a bit that's probably the busiest section actually hands down is the busiest section because you got diamond head peyton's place war eagle um you know those are those are three of the four biggest um, operations. So this section, if you're doing it on Saturday or Sunday, get started early. Uh, Edmondson to No Head. This year I can remember one big fish. Two, I can remember two big fish, but I can also remember a bunch of fish. So at Edmondson, just downstream, is the New Combs Bridge, um, and that's the second bridge down. That's one of those places that if, if the fish are there, if the water conditions are right and the bait fish are hanging around the pylons and the rocks, you can literally stay there all day and you can catch them. And that is one of the places uh, that I would tell you to go if you're just looking to wade fish and you don't have a kayak or you're not wanting to rent a raft or a canoe and float. Uh, if you're just wanting to wade fish, Edmondson Public Access and go to Combs Bridge. Uh, fish around the bridge. There's a gate that you can step over or climb over, uh, and a gravel access road that goes right down to the river. It's a short, easy walk. Uh, don't block the gate. They will tow you, and they will ticket you. 
So uh, there's a public access point just a little bit further up the road with a big parking lot. The bathrooms are actually like a uh, – they aren't really bathrooms, but they're uh, better than a porta potty um, And you can fish right there. You can wade fish up and down. You can actually walk down to the – if you park in the parking lot, you can walk down to the bridge and then fish back upstream. And the way that the river bends right there, you can probably get – uh, you know, a quarter of a mile or so of a, of a walk, uh, fishing back upstream. So again, if I was going to float that, that would be a section that I would recommend you to float. If you just wanted to see something new, uh, don't do it on a Saturday, middle of the day. Don't do it on a Sunday, middle of the day, and definitely don't do it on three day weekend. Um, and moving on down the number one best float, most fish and, and some big fish, just not as many as that P. Vine to Edmondson is no head down to Todd. Now, um, the, the, the trouble that you're going to have there is the Todd Public Access, uh, December of 2018, excuse me, December 2019, Todd Public Access flooded out, washed away, and it's gone. They've closed it, and they're not reopening it. So, uh, I am able to use a private access uh, to take out. Uh, that's roughly six miles downstream from No Head. And um, honestly, because of Todd closing, the fishing there ha had improved this past year over what it has been the past five or six years. And I anticipate that, you know, if Todd stays closed, and it will, uh, according to GRDA, this year it's going to be even better. Uh, and hopefully next year will be even better than that. So um, if you're wanting to float No Head, uh, you know, no head down. You've got about a 10 mile float to make it to Sparrowhawk. Um, that is a, a private access, and I think they're charging like eight or ten bucks, uh, you know, to park uh, in there. And then uh, for a couple dollars more, they'll shuttle you up and drop you off somewhere. So, um, you know, that's a possibility. If you want to go and float, and you know, you've got one vehicle or you're planning a trip down, I would recommend call Sparrowhawk, give them your name, tell them what you're wanting to do, and uh, just give them a heads up so they're expecting you, and uh, put in at no head, and then make the float down to Sparrowhawk. Again, that's going to be 8 to 10 miles, um, and that's going to take you all day, so get started early. Uh, further downstream, I have floated from no head all the way to... Uh, the 62 bridge, uh, which that is got to be close to 15 miles. Um, and that was an overnight, literally camped out on the river, um, caught a lot of fish and had a good time. And, uh, you know, if that's something that you're interested in, get a hold of me. I'll give you some ideas of where to put in and where to take out. All of the public accesses are, um, I wouldn't hesitate a bit to leave a vehicle there overnight. I've never had a problem, knock on wood, with, you know, coming back and anything, uh, you know, being missing or uh, had any problems like that. GRDA has their own river police, and they work 24-7, and they are very, very, uh, they're all over. So you're going to see them, and, and I think they're they're keeping pretty good uh uh, patrols out, you know, and keep keeping everything on the up and up. So any of the public, so on this map, all of the white accesses are public, all of the yellow are private. And the yellow will work with you uh, if you're needing to shuttle, if you're needing to camp, if you're needing to take out, put in, uh, but they're all going to charge you a little bit. Uh, as far as public accesses, you have to have a $1 permit for your kayak or your raft or your canoe. Uh, from GRDA per day. You can get a yearly permit as well for $20, um, and that's it. You can camp. Uh, now, some of the public accesses do not offer camping. If you're coming to camp, uh, your best bet, in my opinion, is going to be Peavine. Uh, no, well, actually, no. Peavine's small. Peavine's got half a dozen or so spots. A round hollow would probably be your best bet. They've got a lot bigger campground. It's a little bit further upstream, but a lot bigger campground, a lot more room. And uh, I think, you know, Peavine would work fine. You're just going to have to get there early, especially if it's on a weekend, uh, you know, to try to beat the rush. 
So, and then there on the the right hand side just gives you an idea, you know, of the distances. And we're going to get to a river map here, the next slide that's going to give miles, you know, per per uh, a section. But P vine uh, around Hollow to P vine, I take six hours to float that. P vine to Edmondson, I can do that in four hours. Um, I don't offer a half a day trips, um, or specifically half day trips only um, with the float trips, but I will do like a day and a half or a two and a half day. And the P vine to Edmondson float is what we do on a half day, uh, just because we can get it done in four hours by, uh, you know, rowing through some of the slower water with, with less fish and hitting the, the, the better spots, the better, more productive sections. And then no head down to Todd. That's an eight hour float. Um, on a good day, me and Kelly Brown, a close friend of mine from Tulsa, uh, we've we have floated that and spent ten and twelve hours on that section more than once. Um, so, you know that'll give you just an idea what to expect. Um, there are guys that will put in and float ten and twelve, fifteen miles in a day and fish, but they're they're fishing fast, and uh, that's just just not not the way that I like to do it. So. Um, six six miles or so, five to six miles on the river uh, at, a, at a steady fishing pace is going to be somewhere between six and eight hours. All right, next slide, please. Uh, so this this map, I don't know if you guys can see it. I couldn't get the uh, scale right, uh, trying to convert it over and get it put up. But it's it's got the public accesses, the private accesses, a little more information, especially up top, showing you where Flint Creek dumps in. Excuse me. But down at the bottom, it gives you the river mileage and breaks it down. And there's another map or a, another um, river mileage scale um, that I've got. I don't think it's in this disc or in this presentation but if you need it I can get that to you and it'll tell you you know Arkansas line is is zero and then one mile down two miles down three miles down and it'll give you all those access points and then you can you know go back and subtract and figure out what the distance is between you know the the access areas so all right next slide please Uh, so upper access, uh, it's everything that we just talked about. It's just another map. Um, now, 27, something that I didn't mention earlier, there's 27 public or there's 27 access areas that are open to the public, but some of them are going to charge you. Uh, there's a couple of other private accesses that if you know the right people, you can gain access to and from the river. Um, so you'll be floating down the river and, you know, you may see somebody with a tent set up or their, you know, their kayaks drug up on the bank or something like that. Um, just be mindful because the private accesses, most of them are posted. So if you see a bunch of people that's out on the bank or swimming or something and there's a big black sign with orange letters that say keep out or posted, just keep on going past it. Go down to the next one and... Uh, you know that that just because there's people there don't mean that it's open to everybody is what I'm trying to say. Uh, so all of the public accesses have launch sites and takeout sites. Uh, most of them are gravel, uh, easy. You know, four wheel drives definitely a plus. If you don't have four wheel drive, be careful about pulling out on the gravel. I can tell you a couple of stories. Um, and then kayak rental places. Uh, there's at least seven. Uh, I can think of it there, there's at least seven in the prime areas and those prime areas are basically going to be in my opinion from Round Hollow down to No Head Public Access um, so 62 miles of river from Horseshoe Bend up to what we, could, we call the Watts area uh, and the Watts area is not to be confused with the Watts area the family um Helen and Simp Watts on the lower Illinois. Uh, Watts is a small community on the upper river. Uh, so 62 miles of fishable water from there. And then there's another eight miles or so um, of water back to the Arkansas state line. So next slide, please. 
So sections in the spring. I, I broke this down by spring, summer, and fall. Um, early season, higher flows is going to be those upper sections. Uh, the, the, the access point above Chewy Bridge that I didn't uh, really talk about is Fiddler's Bend. Um, and it's, it's a great section. Um, a lot of good water through there. The shuttle, the portage between uh, launch site and takeout. Uh, just drive time is killer. It's 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 20 or 30 minutes to get back and forth through there. So um, I would tell you, Chewy Bridge down to Edmondson, um, that's 12 and a half miles that you could fish that all summer long and see the same places, you know, every time that you go through there and you're still going to catch fish, you're going to have a good time and you're going to see stuff that you didn't remember, uh, you know, from the trip before. Uh, so there's three sections through there that are roughly four to five miles a piece, um, and you, you know, you're going to you're going to see fish in there. Most of your fish are going to be 10, 12 inches, and we're talking smallmouth. Uh, it's going to be 10 to 12 inches, but you're going to have those fish in there that are 20, 21, 22, um, even though of a 24 inch smallmouth uh, that that uh, was caught on one of the sections. Some of you know what section. Some of you know who caught that fish, but that fish is there. That fish is released, and um, I'm without a doubt that fish is the new Oklahoma State record. Um, and then again on the weekends, uh, Chewy to Round Hollow is going to be, um, you know, one of the least trafficked uh, or flowed floated areas. And then the other option is going to be on the far far end of that. And that's going to be Edmondson down to No Head only the second half because that first half uh, say three to four miles downstream from Edmondson you're going to encounter floaters from three of the biggest operations on the river but once you pass that last operation you're not going to see anybody so you're going to have another three to four miles of river there that uh, you're going to have all to yourself and it's good it's it's really good water uh, so that's in the spring I'll tell you to focus higher up uh, in the summer Edmondson and No Head. Uh, and this is that section that I was just mentioning. You're going to have a lot of traffic because three big float operations. There's four float operations that operate right through there in that upper half of the Edmondson and No Head. But there's plenty of pools, deep shade cover. I mean, you could fish it on a weekend um, and, and have some room and have some success. But you're also going to have people that are just going to be floating up on you all day long. So uh, keep that in mind. But you could blow through yeah. having trouble breathing here you could blow through that upper half and spend all day long on the lower half if that's what you were needing to do uh, so once you pass the war eagle takeout that's halfway and you've got the river pretty much to yourself and that war eagle takeout uh, that's a good section of the river too there's a, a cliff a rock cliff on the river left and it's deep and uh, caught a lot of fish through there um, fishing two flies this summer, uh, stripping streamers, um, came up, came up with like a donkey rig. If any of you bait fishermen know what that is, uh, on a fly rod, uh, basically you got, uh, two bait fish patterns. The one's on a, on a slip, uh, kind of like a, uh, looped dropper and, uh, gotta be careful on your back cast cause it'll tangle up like crazy, but I was throwing two small clousers and, uh, I doubled up, cut, cut. Two small mouth at the same time, one on the top fly, one on the bottom fly, which is the first time that happened to me. So, um, Next slide, please. This is into the fall. So in the fall, literally the entire river from the top to the bottom, I don't think there's any areas that aren't going to produce a lot of fish. Um, a lot of your float companies will close up at Labor Day or the Monday after Labor Excuse me. Tuesday after Labor Day. Uh, so if you come after Labor Day, a lot less traffic on the river. There are a few float operations that will run, you know, late into November. Um, but most of those guys, you know, are people that are renting kayaks or canoes to fish. Um, and the fishing for the past few years, the, the past three years especially, has been good through Thanksgiving. We've had some pretty mild falls and, uh, you know, I would tell you just 
get started early, get to those good areas, try to try to focus on um, you know the afternoon hours as far as catching the bigger fish. And uh, something that I was told a long time ago by my grandfather uh, and some older guys is when the turtles are on the trees or out on the rocks, the smallmouth will hit top water. So if you're thinking about tying on a top water and it's 55 degrees, but it's sunny and the turtles are up, try it. Man, you'd be surprised what happens. Uh, so the, the fall pattern is usually bait fish. Um, you know, summer, they're going to be more aggressive, warmer water, um, big shad. I uh, had a friend send me a picture of a 20-inch smallmouth that he had caught, and it had a 9-inch sand bass lodged in its, you know, gullet down his throat, and, uh, you know, ended up pulling that thing out, and uh, pretty crazy to see, you know, what a 20-inch smallmouth is eating a sand bass that's almost half his size so uh, just get started early and don't be afraid to throw some top water if uh, if it's even a mild day uh, next section please this is going to be a couple of pictures coming up here i was just going to show you kind of what to expect so this is one of the rocky sections that i was telling you about um, and this section is um, below no head and this is in a, uh, a bend in the river. It's a deep hole right there. Uh, but in the cooler months, the, the bait fish are just all over those rocks. So those rocks are um, south and east facing. So they're in the sun more. Uh, they're in the sun. As soon as the sun clears the horizon, those rocks are in the sun. So they're catching a lot of sunlight and they're getting warmer. And I think the thermal effect is drawing the bait fish to the rocks and then in turn the smallmouth show up to try to eat the bait fish. So uh, that's one of my rafts, a three-person raft that uh, uh, we float it majority of the time. It's one of my uh, favorite ones. And uh, that is on the river left and it is on the east bank. Uh, Greg, Greg Dodge just corrected me. It's on the east bank facing south and west. Uh, so... Next slide, please. This is a big fish that a guy caught with me. Uh, this is in a big hole just above the No Head Public Access. So I put this slide in to show you. Uh, this fish is probably a three pounder or so. Um, and that's uh, one of my buddies from Oklahoma City. Uh, only been fly fishing for uh, a short time. And that is within walking distance of the no-head public access. Uh, quarter mile, maybe. And there's there's a couple of good spots to hit uh, between the two. So you can literally go to no-head public access and then, you know, start walking upstream fishing the whole way. And this was late in the afternoon and a late summer trip. And uh, we had a really, really good day. Caught a lot of fish, but that was one of the biggest ones. Um, and that's just a big dead slow water pool that most of the time people just float past, you know, looking for cover. But this fish was up on a gravel flat and was chasing bait fish. We had see, seen it as soon as we come around the bend. We saw the, you know, the chasing going on. So we beached the raft upstream, got out, walked down the bank, and uh, we're just dripping streamers. And ended up, uh, you know, getting lucky and caught a, caught a really nice fish. So. Moving right along. Next slide, please. So the white bass. Uh, and I didn't know this until just a couple of years ago. But there are people coming from all over the region to fish the Illinois River on the lower sections of the upper Illinois River just above the lake for sand bass. And it's been something that I've just kind of taken for granted. It's just always been there and it's easy. And, you know, I didn't think that a lot of people would be interested in it. But... Uh, I've had some phenomenal days. I've had guys come from out of state that were here to trout fish. And, uh, you know, we get to talking, sitting around the lodge, and they're like, well, what else can we do, man? And I'll tell them, I'm like, well, let's go catch some trout in the morning. We'll drive up to town and grab a bite to eat. And then uh, we'll go up to Horseshoe Bend and catch some sand bass. And then the next year they come back and they fish sand bass for three days straight. And the next year afterward they come back and they fish sand bass for three days straight. So, um, 
you know, I, I just kind of taken the sand bass for granted, uh, just because they were so easy to catch and, um, you know, they were, they were dependable, but, uh, they are something that is a blast to catch on a fly rod. They will literally destroy clouds or minnows and, uh, you hook into a three or four pounder, you know, you got a fish. Uh, so this is the horseshoe bend area. This is further downstream. We kind of skipped a section here. Uh, but, uh, horseshoe bend is the furthest up lake access or the farthest North boat ramp on 10 killer lake. And horseshoe bend is, uh, a, basically that it's just a, a bend that, literally wraps 90 degrees in the upper sections of the lake uh, where the river stops and the lake starts uh, but it's perfect for swinging clousers there's wading access you can fish it from a kayak uh, if you've got a boat river boat there's some gravel bars there you have to be careful on uh, but you know show up with any kind of bait fish clousers uh, you know lunch money circus peanuts um anything that's imitating bait fish uh, bring a couple of different spools um, i would tell you my highest producer this year was a 250 grain uh, 30 foot sink head but in years past i've done just as well on floating line but uh, i would tell you to bring both a 250 to 300 grain sink tip on a seven or an eight weight uh, six weight if you've got a fast rod and you can cast it and don't be surprised if you get onto a 200 fish day. I'll be honest with you, we didn't have any 200 fish days this year, but we dealt with a lot of high water, uh, bad conditions, cold front after cold front, a lot of 50 fish days, a lot of 50 female fish days that were, you know, over three pounds, but uh, we didn't have any 200 fish days this year. But we all we had fun, and everybody that came. Um, you know, ultimately was wanting to come back and, and most of them are coming back. So, uh, and this is going to start usually by the second weekend in March. Occasionally if we have, uh, you know, if the, if the winter stays mild, like we've had, um, it, it, it may start, you know, like the end of February, but, uh, a couple of years ago, the females showed up the first weekend in March, uh, this past year, it was the second weekend. But usually by the second weekend, third weekend in March, all the way through the first of May, uh, they're going to be up there. And again, you can wade fish for them. If you got a four-wheel drive, you can drive right up to the gravel bar, jump out, walk 20 yards, and you're catching fish. If you don't have four-wheel drive, you've got about a half-mile walk uh, up a mud road. Um, if you've got a boat, kayak, um, you know, bring it, and you can launch there, horseshoe bend, and, and motor upstream, and and get onto the smallmouth or uh, the sand bass. Uh, next slide, please. So this kind of getting back into the species thing. So uh, this two um, Neosho smallmouth that me and Kelly Brown doubled up on. He was rowing me around in his raft, and I was able to fish and catch a fish. And he was in the back fishing. And uh, anyway, got got lucky and won't, won't forget that day. But uh, they're not recognized, the, the, the Neoshos, they're not recognized as a separate species. But if you hold one in each hand, you can definitely tell the difference. Um, and if you see the, the one that I'm holding up, if you see the little black specks on his belly, that is a sign of hibernation. So um, Kelly's fish, I'm not for sure, but looking at it from here, it looks like it may be a pure blood. But... Uh, if it has a solid white belly with no black specks, you know, definitely a full blood Neo show. If it's got any black speckling on the belly, um, you know, it's not a full blood. It's, it's a cross and got, got some, either some Kentucky bass or, um, you know, some Northern strain smallmouth uh, in it. So, um, and if you're catching a, if you catch a full blood Neo show, take a picture of it and appreciate it because they are getting harder to find. Uh, next slide, please. So in the mid '80s, uh, some of the things that I found and and was told was that the first stocking happened in 1985. Uh, the Department of Wildlife uh, stocked Ten Killer Lake with the Northern Strain or um, the Tennessee Strain of the the smallmouth bass, and that's the fish that I'm holding up there. 
Uh, and you can tell it just by its green back. There's not a lot of the, the yellow goldish color like you're going to see on a Neo show. Uh, and then the speckling along the belly. Um, this fish weighed six pounds, 6.75 pounds. And that's on a digital scale. Picture's a little skewed, but uh, solid, solid fish, somewhere between 22 and 23 inches. Uh, now, the, these fish, once they have been stocked in the lake, you know, in, in 1985, another uh, bit of information I found said 1987. I don't know if the dates were wrong or if they stocked twice, but anyway, uh, they 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 grow larger, but they don't prefer the moving water like the neo shows do. Um, you're going to work a little harder for the for the you know the lake fish uh, catching them on a fly, but generally they're going to be bigger. Uh, personal opinion: the ones I like the best are the 50/50 fish, the half lake fish, half neo shows, uh, and those hybrid fish are really putting on a, a, a fight. And, uh, you know, they have some of the characteristics of both. Their feeding habits, you know, are still a lot like a Neosho smallmouth, but their size, um, you know, a lot like the lake fish. So it's the best of both worlds. As a conservationist, it sucks that the Neosho is kind of getting bred out uh, because they're super cool fish and, you know, want my great-grandkids to be able to catch them and, and enjoy them. But, um, you know, as an angler... Those hybrids are without a doubt the funnest uh, and, and put up the best fight. So uh, anyway, that's a lake fish. And uh, so this is a, a lunch money fly. This is uh, something that's a streamer, bait fish pattern. A lot of different colors there, but a lot of uh, possibilities to match in forage, uh, color options, um, you know, Basically, it is a rabbit zonker strip with some rubber legs and some dubbing on. These are probably number fours, if not number sixes, maybe a four and a six. That top one, the hook looks a little smaller, and some lead dumbbell eyes. Um, if you have this fly, if you get into fish that are feeding on top and they're literally schooling, uh, you can throw it weightless um, on a on a you know short sink tip line. I've got a teeny. Uh, it's called a mini, mini sink. Uh, it's like a 200 grain, five foot sink tip on an eight weight. And I can put one of these on uh, weightless and catch all kinds of fish and, and make some crazy, crazy cast because it doesn't weigh anything. And all of the weight is right on the tip of the line. So anyway, lunch money's uh, kind of going on a crawdad color phase here with these three flies. Uh, but those those will definitely catch fish and they're pretty simple to tie. Um, you can look it up on YouTube, no problem. So uh, next next slide, we're gonna bump it up here. Been been going for a little while and I want to keep you guys interested. So the upper river, uh, some special flies. So here's a couple of drum that uh, me and my son Cooper doubled up on. Um, there was several of these things feeding up on a, a gravel bar a gravel flat and uh, you know we we switched up put on some uh, you know some small carp flies actually and next thing you know we both got a couple of drum and most of the guys will look at it and be like ah oh, what are you gonna do that nasty old fish i don't know why you want to catch that thing but you know i'm all for catching all those crazy fish and trying to uh trick everything that i can so uh, streamers are going to be your best bet. Top waters, uh, smallmouth, uh, and then rope flies on the gar. And then, like I said, don't forget some carp patterns. Damselfly nymphs, Egan's headstands, uh, San Juans, big San Juans, uh, mega worms. If you guys, surely you guys being from up around the Ozarks know about the mega worms, especially in white for the smallmouth buffalo and the drum. Um, and then rope flies, three eighths inch nylon rope frayed out. Uh, definitely have a couple of them with you because when you roll up on those gar, you're going to wish that you had. Uh, and actually, we're going to get into that on the next slide. So moving along, please. Uh, so again, this is something if you haven't tried it, you need to. You're missing out. Um, I can tell you more than one story about having guys in the raft and we come floating into a hole and there's a dozen 
gar out there feeding, chasing bait fish. And I'm like, hey, guys, you want to catch a gar? And they're like, no, 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 no. And uh, the last trip this year that I remember over that happened, uh, a couple of older older guys and asked them if they were if they'd ever caught gar and neither one of them had asked them if they were interested and neither one of them were so it was right about lunchtime so we beached it and got out and got the ice chest out and you know got all the lunch together and they're chilling out underneath the shade tree and i walk over to the raft and pull out a rod that i had rigged up with a gar fly specifically uh you know for this hole because i'd been through there the past few days and i knew that they were going to be there and within the first two or three casts, I had a chaser, and I start yelling at him. I'm like, man, I'm going to get one in a minute, and uh, sure enough, next cast, put it out there, and I hook up on this fish, and here they come. I mean, the fish starts tail walking, and they uh, they were all in, and then they were gar fishermen, so we spent the next couple hours sitting around there trying to catch all of the big ones out of the hole before we moved along, and uh, I don't think, I know for sure, uh, one of them ended up catching one and getting it up. Uh, you know, to to hold up for some pictures, and I know the other guy ended up tangling up more than once, but I don't think we ever got one in. But all he was wanting was a big one, and you know, you get these uh, these fish that are four and five feet long, uh, tangled up. You know, they'll they'll still pull off. Is what I'm getting at, even though you got them, you know, tangled up in these ropes. And and the strands, the idea, or the way that it works is when you fray that rope out. Um, I use a call me. I'll tell you exactly how to do it. But I use a dog brush, and you fray this rope out. You got a bunch of, you know, literally thousands of small strands of of nylon hanging out, and the gar come up thinking that it's a bait fish, and they chomp down on it, and their teeth have hundreds of thousands of little serrations, kind of like like shark teeth or whatever, and uh, that rope gets tangled up in their teeth, and it's most of the time it's not going to come out. So. Um, Moving right along. Now, this next slide, I actually probably needed to put it below. Uh, so, um, I tell you what, can you can you skip to the next slide and then come back up to this one? Okay. So, down down the river, down from Horseshoe Bend, um, Ten Killer Lake. So they began construction in 1952. I think the lake took three years to build. Or maybe it was three three years. It was either fifty four, late fifty four or fifty six when the lake was completed. I think it was fifty six when the lake was completed. Uh, but uh, the river feeds eight hundred cfs uh, to the lake day in day out three sixty five, um, collecting water from nine hundred square miles. Um, and then I took a couple other notes that I didn't have on here. Um, so the, the Illinois River is a tributary of the Arkansas, and it runs 145 miles in length. And then Ten Killer Lake uh, is 35 miles long, from where the, the river stops and the lake starts all the way down to the dam is 35 miles. So it's, not a, it's a big lake, but it's a long lake that winds in and around you know, the, the ridges and the, and the mountains. Ozark foothills, basically. Um, and then um, the mouth of the Arkansas River, you know, is downstream below the lake. Um, and there's there's about 12 miles there that will sustain trout. Uh, so let's go back up to the, the first slide, please. This is a map uh, or the next. Th there you go. Uh, so top of the map is the powerhouse. Bottom of the map is the Arkansas River. Uh they stock trout here year round. A lot of people don't know that, but this is one of Oklahoma's. Uh, it's Oklahoma's oldest uh, trout stream. Um, it's Oklahoma's highest populated trout stream, um, and it's got the most fishable water, hands down, the most fishable water. Uh, the other one being Broken Bow, southeast part of the state. Uh, but trout stockings occur here every week. Uh, there's four stocking points. Um, actually, I think there's three what now. There's three. There's three now. Uh, they were going to open the fourth one back up, which is at Marvell, and uh, Marvell's a private, uh, uh, like a resort on the river, and they charge access to get in there, like five dollars a vehicle. 
Uh, so, and it's worth the five dollars to go in there and fish just to gain access to the river. But the state discontinued stocking there uh, because they were charging money to gain access. Uh, so, three uh, of the three stocking points with four access areas uh, that are easy to find. Uh, the quality enhancement program. Uh, I believe that happens in March. So I believe four weeks in March, they stock larger than average trout, 18 to 20 inch range. Um, and there are a few brown trout. We don't have near as many browns here as uh, they do down at Broken Bow, but uh, we've got a lot more fish. So, you know, if you're wanting a brown, you know, you can catch them here. It can happen, uh, but most likely you're going to be catching rainbows. Um, and coming on an average day, you know, probably if you know what you're doing, you're, you're fly fishing, I'm going to say, you know, 10 to 20 fish, uh, but a 30 to 50 fish day isn't uncommon. Uh, so this map, um, it's kind of dated, but you can see the arrows at the top, those, those two parking lots, the upper parking lot, which is right at the powerhouse, lower parking lot is the first access downstream. Those are the two of the popular ones, especially for the bait fishermen. And then further downstream, uh, the next area is the Watts, uh, Simp and Helen Watts uh, access area. That is owned by the Department of Wildlife. That is the top of the uh, catch and release area. Um, and that's where most of the fly fishermen are going to concentrate. Uh, a lot of fly fishing up and down the river. You know, don't, don't feel like you need to go somewhere uh, other than wherever you're at. Because you're going to find trout everywhere, uh, all the way up, and and you know down and through the through the river. So next slide, please. I'll skip this one. Uh, so the trout, they were introduced into the river right after the lake was completed. So that must have been in 1955, uh, and this was a mitigation project for uh, you know the federal government agreed to turn the tailwater after they screwed the river up by building the dam and harnessing uh, the water for power uh, to sell it back to people. Uh, they agreed to turn it into a cold water fishery. Um, you can Google that stuff and read about it. Um, anyway, mitigation process where uh, you know, the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife stocks fish uh, and then the federal government stocks fish. Uh, approximately 128,000 trout are stocked uh, in the lower Illinois River every week. Well, stockings occur every week, but 128,000 through the year. Uh, and the trout will survive year to year, high water, low water. It stays cold enough even in the summer months. Uh, this year I did some sampling, and about three miles down, uh, the water was plenty cold enough. Four miles down, it started warming up, uh, and that's in August and September. This time of year, there's fish all the way down 10 or 12 miles you're going to catch trout uh, now the the fish the, the trout are going to be concentrated closer to those stocking areas just because that's where they're getting dumped but you're going to catch fish all the way down the river um, and generally those bigger fish once they do move downstream they do tend to hang out get a little bit larger and uh, you know there's a couple of areas that uh, you're going to need to hike to um, but you, you'll catch some uh, some of the better fish are going to come from those areas and if you need a map for that you call me and I'll get it to you uh, so next slide please uh, this is just another map the red X's are um, the Simp and Helen Watts and then the lower parking lot um, those are my two two places a lot of times what we'll do there's there's nice parking areas at both a lot of times what i'll do if we've got two cars we'll drop a car off at one spot you know the upper parking lot drive down to to watts area get out and we'll fish all the way back upstream we've got a car waiting there for us and come back uh, and then sometimes if there's just two of us three or four of us fishing drop somebody off at the upper parking lot or at the lower parking lot drive down to watts hide the keys and we get out and fish upstream those guys come downstream they come back up and pick us up um, that way we're fishing, you know, about a mile, just under a mile of river and, uh, you know, can, can, we're not having to backtrack, you know, we'll get in the, in the river and go upstream or downstream. So, uh, the trout camp, um, free fishing access, 
that is an area that we call um, uh, the old gravel pits, and it is up from Gore Landing. Um, Marvell, the, the Marvell um, resort I was telling you about, is going to be right in the bend here, up from um, down from Watts and up from the old gravel pits. Um, next slide, please. This is just a fish that I caught out of the Watts area uh, down at the end. Um, I don't know, that's 16 or 17 inch fish. Uh, and I believe I caught that on a, a small black leech pattern, just swinging it through uh, the tail out of a big deep pool. Uh, next slide, please. And this is just some areas of the river to concentrate on. Uh, upper parking area, lower parking area. They're pretty self-explanatory. Um, the dam is the upper. The one right below it is the lower. In the old days, that's the only two access areas that we had if you didn't know somebody that owned water or, or owned property on the water. Uh, Watts area is the next one. Uh, and it's public access. That's the Department of Wildlife. It's catch and release area. That's where most of the fly fishermen are going to be. Marvell, uh, this time of year, Marvell has got some of the better water on the river, and it's worth $5 to get in there. Uh, and if you're going fishing, uh, if you're Euro nymphing, call me. Marvell is uh, has got a couple of the nicest runs and the highest producing areas for me. Uh, Gravel Pits is the next stop further down from Marvell. Um, Four wheel drive. It's uh, pretty rugged getting back in there. It's a uh, basically a gravel road that's not very well maintained. But there's some big striper holes back in there. There's a lot of wet wading. Uh, some bass, smallmouth, and Kentuckys, and then uh, a lot of gar. It's one of my one of my favorite places. The gar fish is down there in one of the holes, uh, just up from Gore Landing, actually. Uh, so between gravel pits and Gore Landing, Gore Landing is the boat ramp. No weight access there. Water is too deep, but that's also the campground. Uh, and they do have a few electric hookups. Uh, no full RV hookups, but they've got electric. Um, they've also got a bathroom there and uh, and the boat ramp. Uh, so moving right along, next slide. Uh, upper parking area is directly below the dam. It's a deep, slow pool with a tail out uh, and a fast, shallow riffle. Uh, it's a pretty good spot to fish if there's not a lot of people there bait fishing with the power bait, you know, anchored up. Uh, and it's going to hold trout all year round. That's where the striper are going to move into in the deep hole uh, right below the sluice gate. And this is the uppermost stocking area. There's actually a cement boat ramp up there, kind of in one of the eddies, uh, just down or, or in a big eddy just downstream from the powerhouse. Uh, so in high water, this is one of the only access or one of the only areas that you can safely wade fish uh, is right there uh, below the upper parking area. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a friend of mine. Uh, Mr. Mack from over at Fort Smith got him a 24, 25 inch rainbow there that he caught. And this is just below the powerhouse in the bend, um, right above the boat ramp. Uh, and that cable behind him is the cutoff at high water that you can't take your boat any higher up. So if you're, if you're looking for a good place to fish and trying to catch a big one, um, Mack, you, you walk to this spot, I'll tell you how to get there, and uh, you, won't, you won't mistake it at all. Uh, next slide, please. This one is for the lower parking lot. This is the second access area below the dam. Uh, it's got some swift runs. got some uh, of the better, two of the better uh, areas if you're into Euro nymphing, uh, which is, is my favorite thing to do. Uh, wading is easy here. Um, pretty uniform bottom, basically just river gravel. And this is also where we launch the drift boats, uh, the rafts, and the kayaks uh, to float downstream. So there's another big male fish that I caught um, right there at the lower parking area a couple years ago. Some kind of streamer pattern in his mouth. I can't see it really well, but uh, next slide, please. Uh, and this is a, a big fish that came right off of the boat ramp at the lower parking lot. And, uh, you know, these, these fish from the catch and release area will move up and down the river in high water and low water. 
and uh, you really just don't know what you're going to encounter uh, or what you're going to catch. So next slide, please. Moving down from the lower parking lot, the next one is the Watts area. It's approximately two and a half miles downstream from the dam. Um, the fly fishing area is where you're going to see most people fly fishing. Um, this is also where they focus on the quality enhancement program in hopes that those bigger fish will move downstream to the catch and release area. Uh, just down from the Watts area, about a half of a mile, there's a cable that spans overhead, uh, and you'll see a big cement structure on the right-hand side or the river right, and that's where the flow gauge for the uh, USGS is at, and they have a, a cable spanning across. That's the start of the catch and release area. It runs about a half of a mile downstream. Um, shallow riffles, deep runs, slow pulls, it's got a little bit of everything. That's why a lot of the fly fishermen end up going here and, and hanging out and liking this spot. Next slide, please. This is my friend Scott Hood. Most of you guys or some of you guys should know Scott. He's a pretty, uh, pretty cool guy from Tulsa area and very, very active with TU, ambassador for fly fishing. And uh, got the pleasure of knowing Scott and hanging out with him on the river from year to year and um, learned a lot from him and, and owe a lot, of, um, a lot of thanks to Scott. So we were at the Watts area. Um, just down from the parking lot and doubled up on two pretty nice fish. And, uh, of course, mine was bigger. Clearly, you can tell in the picture. And uh, But you're going to catch everything in there. I mean, Scott caught a, a spoonbill in here stripping a black woolly booger on a five weight. And uh, I've caught a couple of gar in here. I've caught a skipjack uh, in here. And uh, a lot of smallmouth buffalo, uh, especially in clear water uh, during the spawn, you can wear them out literally right where we're standing all right so moving right along now we're getting to the catch and release area uh, it's downstream from watts cable spanning overhead uh, and this is the best chances for those bigger fish generally they're going to hold further in the tail end of the pool in some riffles just above what we, an area we call the rock garden um, and it's a mile walk to get down to the the end of the catch and release area uh, but uh, it says a mile downstream from the cable. Uh, it's not a mile downstream from the cable. It's a mile downstream from the parking lot. Um, now, I could be wrong on that, but I'm, I'm, I would bet you lunch it's a mile down from the parking lot. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Now we're getting to the gravel pits. Um, I skipped Marvell. Um, mention them here in a minute, but Marvell is the next access point downstream, uh, but it is a paid access, $5 a vehicle. Uh, so this is getting down to the gravel pits. Uh, it's public access. Uh, it's three miles downstream from Marvell. Uh, once you get into the river here, you can go up or down basically as far as you want to go. I mean, downstream, you're going to end up in the Arkansas River in a few miles. Upstream, you're going to hit Marvell, and then you're going to hit some private land that you can't fish. But, you know, it's three miles upstream to Marvell and about, uh, goodness, I'd have to think, man, so two four to five miles downstream before you run into the Arkansas River. So there's plenty of access through here. And this is where you're going to find a lot of the bigger striper. Uh, this fish was caught by a friend of mine, Randy Richter, uh, from up in Iowa. He is a big fish magnet. And I believe uh, this fish is in the 30-pound range and uh, caught it on a huge streamer pattern. Uh, knowing him, it was probably an eight or a nine weight. Um most of the fish you're going to catch, the striper you're going to catch, you're going to be in the 3 to 15 or 20 pound range. Um, but there are those 30 and 40 pound fish in there. The actual state record striper came um, out of a hole just above Marvell, and I think it weighed 54 pounds. Uh, so these fish are coming up the Illinois River out of the Arkansas. And uh, they're showing up in the winter or summer months, and in the winter they're going back down into the Arkansas. Uh, wildlife department uh, was there with them while they were tagging some striper this past summer uh, trying to do some research to figure out if it's the same fish showing back up if they're staying up here or if they're migrating back and forth but your hotter months are going going to be uh, the, the highest producers for numbers of striper especially for a big striper uh, now these these striper are getting up here I mean I've I've caught eight, nine pound striper that's got a 16 inch trout down his throat. So 
you know, if you're coming up here to, to fish for striper, bring those big rods and, and those big flies. Uh, moving along, uh, this next one, this is a striper uh, that came from just below the upper parking lot, just above the lower parking lot. Um, and again, 8 weight to 10 weight rods, uh, everywhere from floating line to 350 grain sink tip line to full sink line um, and be able to cast. That's the, the, the hurdle is... You know, you need to be making 50 and 60 foot cast at least uh, because a lot of times we're fishing these fish in clear, clear water and they're spooky. Um, next slide, please. Uh, by mid morning, the striper are usually deep. So if you're after them, you know, four, four, four thirty in the morning, you need to be in the parking lot gearing up and be, you know, really, really focusing on, uh, you know, the, the, the time between daylight to sun up because once the sun hits the water you know the striper they're going deep they're going to the shaded holes uh, the good thing is you know it kind of condenses them to where you're going to find them but you're getting in you're getting away from top water action and you're getting into big heavy sink tip lines uh, and big heavy weighted flies trying to get to depth uh, so if you're coming after striper get started early uh, gore landing it's the last public access downstream before you get to the arkansas river no waiting. Uh, you find striper here year round. It's kind of an influx to where the Arkansas is still backing up and you're getting the warmer water in the summer or in the winter, but you've got the colder water coming down in the summer as well. Uh, white bass, March and April. And again, that is the boat, uh, the boat ramp and the camping, uh, camping area, Gore, uh, Gore Landing. So next, next slide. Uh, same guy with a different striper that he caught. That was uh, the same hole down below the, the powerhouse and above the uh, the lower parking lot. And, you know, the, the night fishing is, uh, is something if you've got any experience stripping streamers on Tanicomo or the White River for trout, it's kind of the same thing here. Big bait fish patterns, you know, barely subsurface, just breaking the film or big poppers and uh, deer hair divers and hold on because you don't know what you're fixing to get tangled up with so uh, we're almost done here guys just a couple more slides um, resorts and lodging uh, you know if, if you don't have time to write all this down call me I'll shoot it to you but this is giving you the breakdown of places to stay uh, Sweet 16 is in Gore and this is all on the lower section the lower river um, I didn't do one of these for the upper section but just about any of the uh, kayak and canoe rental places has either got camping and uh, uh, cabins uh, or some type of lodging. Uh, so Marvell Resort, really nice place. They've got full RV hookups. Uh, so if you've got a camper of some sort, you can pull in there. And then myself, Oklahoma Fly Fishing, um, we've got a small lodge. Uh, I can sleep up to six guys, uh, four guys comfortably. Uh, six guys in a pinch with a little bit of planning if somebody doesn't mind sleeping on a cot or an air mattress. Uh, next slide. It's just a picture of the, the lodge. Uh, upstairs, it's a loft style. Uh, got got four beds upstairs, five beds upstairs. I'm seven miles from the river. We've got a big screened in porch out, uh, outside. And then we've got a grill with a fire pit, charcoaler, char and a gas grill. And uh, I do offer some trips that are all inclusive where I'll feed you and, you know, we'll drinks and everything that you're going to need. You just show up and um, I've even got rods. All you need is just the, the desire to go. Next slide. This is the camping and RV sites, uh, Gore Landing, Ten Killer State Park, Marvell. Uh, basically, any of this information will be found on Google pretty easy. But if you do need some uh tips or some hints on places that I would go, uh, just give me a call. I'll help you out. I mean, they're all clean. They're all nice. Uh, Marvell is probably the nicest. Ten Killer Harbor or State Park would be the second, but they're further away. And then Gore Landing just because it is a public camping area. Um, next slide, we're getting into rod line, or rod weights. Trout, three to six weight, eight to nine foot. Um, basically the same stuff you guys are going to use up there. You know, fishing any of the Ozark streams. Um, 
really nothing different there than probably what most of you guys are fishing. Uh, bug life chart. Uh, give me a shout. I'll send you a screenshot of this. It's the same year in, year out. Um, catch fish on a lot. I mean, they are stalkers. There are, you know, some holes, hold, holdover fish that do get a little smarter. But if you're struggling, I would tell you town a white mega worm or a pink egg and go to town. Um, occasionally, some little black and yellow marabou jigs, the micro jigs. Uh, will outproduce everything, but this gives you an idea kind of what to expect. Um, and again, it's not a whole lot different than what you're going to find, you know, in most of the areas that you guys are fishing up there anyway. So whatever you've got in your fly boxes for trout is probably going to work. Uh, next slide, we get into striper, uh, big streamers, uh, anything that is shad based, gizzard shad, six to eight inches long. Uh, clousers are going to work. They're easy. I would tell you something that's going to push a lot of water with a big head, you know, something, you know, that, that uh, got a little bulk to it. Slump busters are great. Uh, they're, they're easy to tie, and you're going to break some off. So don't, uh, you know, don't spend all your time tying a fly that's taking you 15 or 20 or 30 minutes because uh, they're going to get lost. Uh, tungsten, my personal favorite. I use a lot of tungsten cones, even that I'm going to hide inside, a, you know, a head of some sort with some some type of uh, dubbing or um, material around it. And then sink tip line, intermediate. If you're only going to bring one, bring intermediate. Um, but if you've got them all three, I would tell you bring them all three: sinking, intermediate, and floating. And uh, you know, striper are going to be in usually from April. Uh, through October and they're definitely going to be here best months usually July August and September next slide uh, rod weights for striper 8 to 10 weight uh, if you've got a two-hand rod or spay rod there are areas where you know you're going to be able to cast it and hit 100 150 feet if you want um, weight forward line for sure uh, sinking leaders and then again intermediate sink tip line or floating line all of them uh, if you're wade fishing uh, stripping basket is going to be um, a benefit especially in some of the areas with a little bit of current uh, and it'll keep you from walking all over your you know your stripping or, or your line that you're stripping in especially if you got studs on so um, all right next slide this is just my information phone number email uh, you can find me on facebook don mcclary fly fishing and uh, I'm on Instagram as well. Write down my number, get a hold of the Mako guys, uh, or look me up. And then the next slide has got my um, website and then just a little bit of information on wade trips and drift boat trips. So I prefer the drift boat trips uh, for smallmouth, but we can do some wade fishing. We um, just get a lot more access as uh, you know we're in the rafts going up and down the river so um, anyway if you guys got any questions or anything I can help you with reach out to me and let me know if you're interested in booking a trip uh, we'll get that done as well well perfect thank you very much for uh, coming on and talking to us uh, that was very beneficial well, we thanks for are yeah, absolutely. Uh, we are a little pressed for time, so we're going to reserve our typical question and answer segment. But if you have a question out there that you'd like to ask Donovan about the Illinois or any of the fishing tips, tricks that he's got for you, um, feel free to reach out to either Mako or him uh, by email. Is probably the easiest. Would you agree? Um, uh, yeah, we'll, or you can text. Yeah, I mean emails, uh, texts come through, and man, I'll answer texts when I'm standing on the river. If we got. You know, if I got a minute, so it works right. for you. Yeah, just and we will post it. all of those in a comment on this video, so easy to find. Uh, but thank you again. I uh, hope that was very informative and beneficial to everyone. I know we had a good time here, so thank you very much. Thanks for having me, guys, and have a good night. Good night. Absolutely. Bye bye.